Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Over the past couple of years, Graham Pullen and I have filmed quite a wide range of videos for fishing films and facts, but far and away the most popular, if feedback comments are anything to go by, are those with the word carp in their title. One in particular that's really grabbed coast anglers' attention is the one entitled Float Fishing for Carp. There's nothing particularly special about it. It's just a plain and simple demonstration of catching plenty of good sized fish on a piece of bread flake suspended just off the bottom under a float. So why then in your opinion do you think that that particular demonstration has caught on in the way that it has? Well newcomers to carp fishing and by that it doesn't necessarily mean youngsters, it can actually mean older guys that are coming into fishing or coming back into fishing. They must think when they look at uh, what's in the angling publications that it's just about uh, one bait, which is the boilie, and you basically have to sleep on the uh, on the lakeside in a sort of big green tent thing when you look at around a carp lake, which uh, are the bivvies. And, you know, I guess they started in the era that I started my carp fishing, you know, probably, well, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, probably. Prior to that, as regards staying on the bank overnight, no problem at all. We used to fish right through the night, but we never went to sleep like they do nowadays. We didn't have bed chairs. We just, you know, you'd have a deck chair and you'd stay out all night. We didn't have uh, initially electric bite indicators when I was uh, a youngster. It was a piece of silver paper on the line, and you just sat there watching a piece of silver paper all night long. Sometimes you had a torch on it on and off just to check things. Another way guys used to do it. I'm sure the real, the carp guys today, the young guys, won't have a clue what I'm talking about. They think it's archaic. But we used to have a tin, like a, a sort of a beer can, Coke can, and you put a coin on your line, and then it would fall off and go in the tin, so that it made a noise when the tin goes, and you just watch the silver paper come up. So you could actually rest your eyes by closing your eyes. <laughs> I dare say we did doze off a few times to sleep, but um, I didn't lose any rods and reels in the lake. I've had them go in, but I've always got them back. But coming into it today... I don't know, it's a sort of indoctrination about it in the publication. So this is the way to catch the fish. You've got to have all this paraphernalia and rigs and terminal rigs. And do you know what we had when we, when we first started, when I was a youngster, we had a hook. We might have had a lead and a split shot and a swivel, and that was it. And we still caught carp. And you can even still demonstrate today that it's still possible to catch carp on a regular basis without all that tackle and paraphernalia and... The only bait in the world is a boilie. Um, no, I don't think so. But people are there to earn money. they got a business in tackle. Who can blame them, you know? And in fairness, you get a good tackle dealer, he will send you to the right place and set you up with rigs. You've got to understand he's there to sell you tackle. He's there to sell you bait. Fair enough. Guy's got to earn a living. You've just got to hope that he does supply the youngsters with the right gear. One of the problems that I can see is that... Um, there's other techniques that you can use. It's not just distance casting with, you know, two or three, what we would call them, bolt rigs when I was first starting with it. And it's just a way the fish picks up and uh, away he goes and he hooks himself on a tight line. You can be asleep in the bivy, it doesn't really matter. The fish has hooked itself. The bait runner attachments supply tension to the line. You know, you just walk out, pick the rod up, fish is on anyway. You know, you don't really even have to strike now. What a luxury. I wish I had that when I was younger. The problem being today that people want instant success. They want great big fat ballooned out fish. They want great big ones because that's all you ever see in the angling press. Great big distorted fat things. Now, if you look back over the years and go back to the year, I say, when I was late teenager, the people I look up to, Jack Hilton, Dick Walker era, yeah, okay, probably sounds a bit old fashioned, but take a look at some of the black and white photographs of the carp that they caught because the carp then were totally different to the ones you catch now. You don't get these, I suppose they're full of boilies, I don't know. Uh, Whatever they're full of, they're like balloons. You know, they're a 20 pound carp now weighs something like 30, 35 pounds. But they're not a bigger fish, they're just a great big balloon fish. I don't honestly even think that these balloon shaped fish, and I'm not saying I'm a big carp expert, I'm certainly not. I'm just an ant under the boot in the carp world because I haven't caught a 30 pounder yet. Plenty of 20 pounders, but I haven't caught a 30 pounder. But they don't just don't fight like they did years ago. I'm sorry. They just, you don't get the good scraps like you used to. And the tackle that people are using now, I see rods and reels. Well, we used to beach fish with gear like that. In fact, I'd be pleased to go cod fishing off the beach, throwing a six ounce lead with some of the carp gear I've seen. 
But why is all this overkill on tackle? I don't know. I don't, I don't really sort of understand it, I suppose. The unfortunate thing is there is a sort of a trend set by publicity that the only good carp is a big carp. And if you're a youngster or you're an older guy that's coming back into the sport, and you you know you're looking through it, you you would almost deem yourself a failure if on the second night using X flavour boilie or whatever bait it is you use, you haven't caught Gertie the thirty. They're disillusioned. They haven't started like we did as a youngster on a canal or lake or river, float fishing a worm in the margins, catching perch a half a pound, which was a great fish of its time. My golly, some of these youngsters they wouldn't even use a, a perch as a dead bait now, or, or, or hopefully not a live bait, because they're nice fish to catch anyway. I can tell by what I talk to them, you know, they're just so indoctrinated with all this big fish. Well, it's just a, it's just a muddle of gobbledygook to me. All I know is, I go carp fishing, I catch carp up to and just over 20 pounds. It's not rocket science, I'm not using some obscure secret bait or anything like that, some special mix, I can trust me, I just use bread and lunch and meat and worms and sausage and hot dog segment by the way hot dog segment is one of my favorite baits and if you actually take a bite out or even smell it yourself you'll know that it does taste and smell and feel a lot softer than normal luncheon meat so even though you're catching on luncheon meat these hot dog segments are really really good still and you know why they're still good because most anglers don't even use them I read recently a report in the Angling Press bemoaning the fact that most coarse specimens and records these days are now being caught by carp anglers, fishing high protein baits left to work for themselves on self hooking rigs such as a bolt rig, to the point where records and specimens are just being pushed ever further out of reach of everyday pleasure anglers, and that all of this is doing coarse fishing no good at all. In fact, Many young carp anglers these days have absolutely no concept of the art of float fishing, freelining and the like, and as such, these skills are fading into history. What are your thoughts on that? The fact that high protein baits and fishing for a long, long time, sitting by water or sleeping, virtually living there, catches big carp, yes, fine, we know that works, but can you honestly expect, you know, youngsters coming into the sport, A, to afford all this tackle, B, to have enough money to go and buy all this bait, and C, get time outside their general education school time to go and sit for three days and three nights by a lake. On the off chance that they might catch a big fish, and then they'll be accepted by the rest of their friends. No, they've got to catch fish. Kids want them using really, really quickly. I've got two kids, and they're both in their 20s now, and even now, they still want amusing, short term. You've got to keep them occupied, keep that brain working. I find, personally, I get a great deal of satisfaction, not just from doing all these films, and we have a huge following of youngsters, I don't know, I guess by their writing it's like late teenagers, but youngsters, and they are absolutely soaking up the information. Well, one guy contacted me, he was not a youngster, he'd seen one of my films, and he had, I mean, a phenomenal catch just fishing in the margins with basic baits. He outfished all the boilie boys and the bivvy boys. He had, I think it was something like 10 doubles and 220s in the margins in a day, and even he was shocked. Boy, if you think he was shocked, I certainly was, because that's absolutely fantastic fishing. But it just goes to show he's probably the only guy on that water that's actually using a really basic, simple method. And of course... You look at it from a youngster's point of view, it's more profitable in the terms of costs, the tickets and the bait. Now, here's one of my big bugbears. I'm definitely not a committee man, I'm not a yes man, I've no interest whatsoever in all the fanning around and gobbledygook of committees and rules and regulations. I try to adhere by the rules and regulations of any fisheries, but I've no interest in clubs. Why? Because a club charges that sometimes quite extortionate joining fee. Now what's that all about? So they lease the water, they pay for the water, they stock it with fish, fair enough, they want to recoup their money. They want youngsters coming into the sport. Many clubs have poor memberships now or falling memberships. They want youngsters coming in and they say, oh, there's nobody young coming in anymore. Well, I'm not surprised because you say, okay, we'll join it with a subscription fee. And then they, what else comes into it? Oh, uh, you've got a joining fee. A joining fee? Well, what's the subscription fee then? What are you paying for? So I'm really anti-joining fees on any club, really. If they want you in the club, and if you're approved as a member, that's it, end of story, you've paid exactly the same amount as everybody else. What would you want to pay a joining fee? 
Here's my illustration. You walk into Waitrose, you walk into Morrison's, you go into any supermarket, you fill your trolley up, you walk to the checkout, you get to the checkout, you pay your bill. You don't get company to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me chum, uh, that bill was 55 75 we want another £40. What for? Oh, walking through the door, just a joining fee, just to give us a bit extra money. No, I don't think so. I think you get what you pay for, and that's it. End of story. And of course, that's why a lot of people won't join fishing clubs. If they don't join a fishing club, where do they go? They can go to a regular day ticket water, a commercially stocked day ticket water. Now, they generally won't have a huge amount of £40 carp in. Two points. They just cannot afford the fishery owner to stock it with a lot of £40 carp, and the density of the water the fish population will not stand up having 230 or 40 pound carp in there. There's just simply not enough food in there. What happens? The fish weights all disappear. And they drop back because there's just too many fish for too little water. So if they've got fish in there from say two pounds to 20 pounds with a scattering of double figure fish, that is all that the average angler needs to keep himself amused. Youngster, beginner, do you know what? Even experienced guys go to some of these commercial waters now and then. And what do you do? Pay £10, £7, £8, whatever it is. A lot of them have well, it's so many rules, it's beyond belief. But it's also good business because where else would you go in a sport whereby you pay, let's say, £10. The guys put the fish in the, in the lake anyway. So he's, he's done his outlay. You pay him £10. And then guess what, guys? you're actually paying to feed his fish by throwing all the bait in. Well, that strikes me as a really good business plan. You pay somebody, and they actually come, put money in the, in the till, as it were, and then they go and buy some more bait and feed the fish for you. God, it's got to be good, isn't it? Day to get waters are good because you don't have all that hassle where you just turn up on the day, pay your money, you get what you get in that day, and that's it. But with a good day to get water, you know there's some nice fish in there, you know it's been stocked well, it's maintained well, you don't have all the hassle, but... On the other hand, you might have regulations, you can't night fish, and one of my main bugbears is, oh, you can't use floater baits. Now, some of them have so many rules, it's like they want your money, but they don't actually want you catching the fish. So they just pile the rule upon rule on you. And, well, there's no way around it, you've got to change your techniques to adapt to that. And fishing basic, simple techniques on basic, simple tackle generally works for me. Do you feel, then, that carp angling has become a lazy man's pursuit? Rather than working for the successes and enjoying more of them, growing numbers of anglers are prepared, maybe even indoctrinated, into throwing out scientifically prepared baits to be left for as long as it takes and to work for themselves. In some cases, presumably, because they simply don't know any different. Oh, uh, looking at the modern carp scene today, I wouldn't say they're, they're lazy men. I think it's a lazy way of fishing. I like the fact that you can go around a lake, um, you can go in the margins, you can poke around places. A bivvy guy generally sets up, targets out his baited area, and that's him for whatever the period he's going to be sitting there. It can be two days, two nights, hundreds of hours, who knows. Whereas those fish nowadays, and I've heard this from other people as well, the distance casting guys are actually not twigging that a lot of fish are getting spooked by the leads hitting the water and the tight lines or general lines laying across the, the lake bed and they're coming away from the distance and they're coming in tight around the margins basically to get away from all the activity that the long distance guys are putting out there. So it's all gone full circle where it used to start close in fishing for me years ago. Even then a 20 yard cast would be a long cast. You didn't have to cast a long way for the fish. They were you know, generally within about 20 yards of the bank. Now that's gone full circle and some of the big fish as well come right into water under your feet. And why these guys that sit there on long duration periods don't put one out and one literally free lined, I'm not kidding, two feet under the bank, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure that they'd hook up a lot more than possibly they do at the moment. It isn't really anybody's fault, I suppose. It's just a fashion how fishing has changed over the years. But the, this big carp scene is absolutely dominating the press, the media, the tackle industry. It's, a, it's a, just a huge money-making machine. It doesn't matter how big the carp grow, the youngsters don't have an appreciation of catching small carp, medium carp, and then larger carp. They don't build up to it. They want instant success when they've got that, and if they get that instant success, they're bored. Where do they go? Oh, back off to the PlayStation or whatever, because fishing seems too easy. Well, surely it wasn't like that in my day. And certainly, the problem today is 
These anglers, a lot of them, they have absolutely no watercraft whatsoever. They just read in a magazine somewhere, this is a way to do it, great big lead on the end. Whatever the latest fashion or craze or rig is at, at, at the end of the day, out it goes, they sit there, they are the catch. Or when you actually physically talk to a lot of these guys that you think have got all the kit, do you know what? They don't actually catch much at all. They've sort of lost their way in pursuit of the ultimate prize. The ultimate prize is the appreciation or let's say your personal best fish. That's what it used to be when I was younger. Years ago when I was a kid, and I used to go, I used to bunk off a of school, never mind I have enough money to go fishing. We go down one of the local lakes, it was allegedly free, but it was free to us because nobody ever came around for a ticket. It was like an estate lake, and we just poached it as kids do in that era. So we're talking like, <laughs> we're talking 50 years ago, guys. And we used to go down, dig up the potatoes out of the farmer's field there, boil them up, and then we'd cube up or even shape the boiled potatoes to whatever we wanted, put them on a size 2 carp hook, put a crust pad, a little square, one inch square crust pad, so the hook didn't pull through the bottom of the bait, and that crust pad would enable us to cast, wait for it, a free line potato at least 75 or 80 yards. No lead, no nothing. But the downside was we didn't know much about the watercraft or the fish, and those fish were wild carp in the five to eight pound range and I remember going down there with a guy called John Freeman and my first car was wild carp about five pounds we went down bunked off school for the afternoon went down baited up and we took a tent and we camped out that night god knows how many runs we had quite a few but for some obscure reason which was batty we were feeling letting the line run through our fingers because we thought the carp had to turn the bait before they swallowed it you know a bit like a pike stupid but there you go but eventually we started hooking fish and we were away Boiled potatoes? If you told guys that now, they'd fall off their bed chair. If you can get a hang of a decent basic idea of watercraft and a feeling of where those fish are going to move during the day, during the afternoon, during the evening, the carp also lay up under bushes during the daytime. They're not always out in the middle cruising and rooting around. I mean, they're basically, let's face it, they're, they're fairly basic creatures. I'd, they're like a sort of as a pig goes rooting around in a mud, I suppose. I hope I don't offend anybody, but they're sort of, I see them like, whereas they eat everything and dig around on the bottom, they're sort of like pigs of the lake, aren't they? They go around rooting and digging just like pigs do in fields, and they pretty well eat anything. There's no question of that. Do you need all these fancy baits? Yeah, it's up to you guys whether you want to waste your money or not. I don't personally catch anything else on bread, lunch and meat, worms, bit of sweet corn, though I'm not really a great lover of sweet corn. Just all basic stuff, and you know, I did that, like the parboiled potatoes we used 40 years ago, it still works today. And what's happened is the guys haven't twigged that things do go full circle and you can actually look, you know, catch on those basic baits if you get a bit of watercraft in your head and a bit of experience by learning when to go. The barometric pressure, whether is the wind pushing onto the bank or away from the bank? Uh, how deep is the water? Uh, what's the temperature drop off the night before? Or is there a frost the night before? Is that going to push the fish away from the margins? We all know about casting out by the edge of islands, that's sort of old hat now, but a lot of guys don't capitalise on, let's say, fishing on either side of a bush. Why not bait either side of a bush, catch a fish from one side, then go around the other side, and there'll be fish feeding there that haven't been touched? Or what different swims? Why not bait two or three different swims, go and have half an hour in each, little short sessions, until you see either bubbling, you see fish movement, you see mud stirred up, you see the water moving where the carp are digging on the bottom and their tails are in the surface. Lots of little things, and this can be two, three feet from the bank in maybe a foot or two feet of water. What I'd like to do now is to go on to look at the three carp fishing films we've made, exploring the thinking, approach and value behind each technique in turn and what it can bring, starting with our first film, Carping in the Margins. See, one of the things what happens, especially on commercial waters where they've got a lot of anglers putting quite a bit of bait in, those carp know that after about four o'clock, which is when, let's say, Joe Average packs up, or the kids have got to go back home, they've got tea, they've got to do their homework, they generally get their little two-point bait tin and they chuck it in the margins. It might go out five, six feet, four feet, whatever. They don't tip them on the bank. You generally just toss it in the water. They rarely, rarely take the trouble to bait up where they previously baited up and were casting to. Now, the fish know this. They know those, all that feed's going to go in there close in. And after about, let's say, four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd say in the summer, then those carp will become active and will start coming around the margins. So, 
look for when the fishery goes a little bit quiet, people are packing up and leaving. You can even watch them as they pack up, and watch exactly right to the X marks the spot where these guys are tossing their bait in. You can go there and say 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you can fish till 8 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'll tell you what, on a good day you can have something like 6, 8, 10 fish, you might clip a double figure, you might get a big 20, you never know. But generally you've got much more chance if you go where somebody else has dumped this bait in. Because I go for short sessions, I don't do the long sessions. Now I have done long sessions, I've done all the distance casting, I've done all the bivvies, all this business. I've done all that years ago, in fact, at one stage, I actually had two days and two nights fishing solid, eyes open. I think we only had the old heron bite indicators. Mine were so corroded with old batteries, they barely buzzed intermittently anyway. And I can remember on the second day, I was getting hallucinations because I hadn't been to sleep. You know, for nearly 48 hours, I felt like SAS soldier on manoeuvres. But, you know, I wouldn't have missed that for the world, but I now realise you don't need to stay up day and night. We had to, because we were watching pieces of silver paper, bobbins to move visually. We didn't have the luxury of bed chairs. And I mean, I mean there's even one guy used to fish one of my local lakes, I remember. He had so much stuff that you can buy wheelbarrows now, like special carts to wheelbarrow all your gear down. And this guy had a 12-volt battery and a portable television. He was fishing at the lake so much. Now, is that fishing? Well, I don't even think that's camping, is it? You're there that long. I've fished several times, a lot of times, on day ticket waters that people have been there with the bivvies and the boilies and they've been on their bed chairs and they've chucked all their stuff out and they're catching nothing and I have had an absolute blinder. And do you know what? They rarely even look up because half of them, you know, they go to sleep. They're not conscious of things changing, of fish moving on the surface. You might get stuff like Swallows are swift dipping because the insects are moving and when you look underneath that you see there's a bit of movement where the carp also know the insects are moving. There might be an emerging fly that's coming out and that's why the swifts and swallows are starting to dip and take them as well. So there's activity. You should be in there with a floating bait, some dog biscuits or a piece of floating crust. Of course, if you're laying asleep on the bed chair, you're not going to see that. So I'm always going to pick off those extra bonus fish. As far as feeding the swim on the little and often basis goes, I'm quite happy to go and dump a load in because if I'm only fishing from let's say four till eight o'clock or four till nine o'clock in the summer, I know that the fish are aware of anglers dumping bait on commercial tickets. So why would I want to feed on a little and often basis and then the fish go mad for the last 10 minutes before I have to get chucked off the fishery? I don't want that. I'm quite happy to go there, pile a load of bait in a couple of swims close by in the margins and then I can relax for half an hour, and generally within half an hour, those carp are going to move in and start feeding. Some places you go, if you're very, very quiet, and you're just using one rod and you're moving around carefully, keep back from the margins, you can bait them up so you actually see their backs right out of the water. And there's nothing more exciting, trust me, than lowering a piece of bread, a piece of flake, a piece of lunch of meat, a bunch of worms, just down onto the nose of a fish that's just popped up to have a look around, and you see those big lips come up and suck your bait down. You set the hook, the rods go in, the reel screaming. That's what it's all about. You're on light tackle, you're on not necessarily light line, you can be on six, eight pound line, but you're on a light, something like an Avon rod. My goodness, there's some sport there. And to me, that's what the buzz is, that fish takes off and runs. You're not hooking them a hundred yards away on 30 pound braid line and a rod that could pull a plug out of a bath in Australia. All of which is very clearly demonstrated on the Carp in the Margins video. But can we now move on to close in float fishing, which I personally find equally as exciting. The film we did on a float fishing for Carp, we just went there and if I recall correctly, all the film was just straight from the hip, we didn't have any storyboard, we just went fishing for half three quarters of a day, I think we had 13 Carp to whatever we had, it's on the film. Really good fishing, we could have caught a lot more carp if we weren't faffing around filming. But that film, for some reason, I have no idea why, has gone absolutely ballistic. I think the last time I looked on YouTube, it was, I think it was Flowfish for Carp, it was over 55,000. Now, I have no idea why it's gone like that. There's nothing more basic than float fishing for carp. We were trying to be as easy and as simple as we could catching fish, and we caught fish to camera. We could do no more. It was on a basic bait didn't even cost us five pounds for the bait and I think it was a tenner for the ticket. I mean the fish we caught was unbelievable. And do you know what? It's not just that fishery. There's loads of day to get water so you can do that sort of fishing on. There's no question that if you put the word carp into YouTube, everything pops out the woodwork. It all comes up. So I feel honestly that there's a whole generation of anglers that are missing 
some superb fishing. I mean, the fishing, let's face it, is degenerating rapidly with the, all the pressures that are on it, you know, from nitrates in the water causing weed blooms, um, then a predation in the shape of, well, the worst one I think are those um, red signal American crayfish, because they're going to take the eggs and the fry that have been, so there's nothing coming along for the future. Cormorants, oh goodness me, it just goes on and on and on. So the pressure is there, huge pressure on our fish stocks. But they're still about, there are still places you can catch them. But if you read the magazine's publications, you think it was just carp was the only fish in the world. So I suppose you'd call it the British national fish is the carp, I suppose. Yes, it's, it's been drummed into us. You've got to get a balloon belly carp or you're a failure in life. So for me, I do all round fishing. I do a bit of everything. I don't care if it's a dace, a pike, a grayling, tench, whatever. They're all fish. They all require different techniques, and they all require a different tackle, a different approach. And do you know what? That's what keeps your brain active, not just carp, carp, carp all the way. And let's not forget our most recent film, Freelining. I personally, my favourite method of fishing is visual, which is surface fishing, because I can go and soak a load of dog biscuits, and when they've swollen up, I can catapult them out, and I can see visually anywhere on a lake where there's going to be some movement. Now, you don't just sort of bait up and think that's where the fish are. You don't really know where the fish are when you're floater fishing unless they're under bushes. If you're just in an open expanse of water, they could be absolutely anywhere. So if you scatter your catapult, you know, all your all your biscuits in a wide as area as you can, loads of them, you've got a much better chance of isolating and targeting any fish that starts taking them and moving them on the surface. Then you can either catch them off the surface or you can approach it with a different technique. You can be ledgering or you can float fishing or you can free line those fish on the bottom as well. But it is an excellent way and a very relaxing way, I hasten to add, because you can just catapult all this stuff all over the place, sit back, chill out, and if nothing takes any of these, we've well, lost nothing, have you? What have you lost? Time. Because with with the new water, I like doing it because it tells me where the fish are and where they're moving. If I turned up at a new water, I haven't fished before, same thing, I could obviously evaluate it by plumbing the depth a sort of generalising, maybe talking to other anglers, trying to find out where the good taking areas were, what the good depths are. But with a new water floater fishing for me, targets them individually. The downside, I would say, is a lot of day to get waters for some obscure reason. They have so many rules and regulations, they ban floater fishing. Now, I can understand it if there's loads of ducks there, but I mean, you don't go floater fishing for ducks. If a duck or a goose or a swan or something comes over to you, you just wind in. You just let them eat all your bread. Or what I do is I go and feed them in another corner of the lake, just take a, a 30p cheap Morrison's supermarket load, heave it in the corner somewhere, that keeps them occupied, then come back and put your own floaters out and a swim that's on the other side of the lake. So you can effectively lure them away and sort of feed them off. But, now here's a tip. When there is floater fishing and floater activity, a lot of people don't like the ducks eating all their biscuits on the top. I don't worry too much, because the carp, again, where floater fishing is allowed, are totally aware of those ducks' activity. And I believe they can actually hear that pecking and slurping that the ducks are doing, the fast paddling, they know something's going on on the surface, it actually brings them up. And for the same reason, I like to use dry bran, which is just an agricultural horse feed, and it floats on the surface, and it disperses over a wide area, millions and lots of little pieces, it brings up species like rudd and roach, and the activity of those fish feeding actually does attract the others. So if you get some bran, you can drift it out into the lake, and then you put your few free samples, it can be floating crust, it can be pedigree chum mix of biscuits, any form of dog biscuit, and you put those out, you'll get the little rod and roach nibbling around your bread flake, and then you'll absolutely see it go quiet. And when it goes quiet and those little fish stop nibbling, that's a sure sign that a big carp started to move in on the activity. So be prepared for a big pair of rubbery lips to close on your bait, and you've got a good hookup. I suppose what I do like about Floater fishing is, I don't like floater fishing at distance, and that reason I don't use all these float controllers. And I mean, I've seen some the size of pipe bungs that guys throw out. I mean, how they catch fish at that distance is beyond me, because when you go to set the hook, you've got to move the float as well. Um, so it's not for me. I mean, it does work, I dare say, but, you know, I think I, I may outfish anybody in the margins, because when I strike, it's just a straight onto the hook, and that's the end of it. You can't get any more basic than just a hook on the end of the line. And again, on, on surface fishing, the cult movement within carp fishing seems to be people are getting away from the bivvies, away from the boilies, because you know, let's face it, it can be pretty boring, is they like that visual aspect. Now, some fisheries, they ban the use of floating baits. You can get round of that by using a fly. 
and that way you can also chum them up with biscuits because you're throwing them out you're not actually using a floating bait on the hook you're using the floaters as a tractant and then you cast a fly out to them and that is catching on big time it's a bit like fly fishing for bass has caught on in the saltwater scene you know around the uk coast a lot of people like fly fishing for bass for pollock for mackerel it's just something different it's entertaining and you generally get the more experienced guys doing it because i guess they've caught all the big carp they want on the regulation semi boat gear that they use and they want a bit of sport now they're just wound in the big fish got the photograph got the t-shirt now they want some sport so they're going to fly fishing and that is another way to approach your fishing moving on from the baits i've got to be honest i'm not uh, i'm not the the best person to ask about all the different flavors of boilies and which ones work and which ones pop up pop down pop sideways pop out your ear i have no idea whatsoever i don't think i've even used a boilie i'll be perfectly honest so what i did with one of my films, I did one called Carp on Roast Dinner for a bit of fun with the wife and actually went down to a water. It was a day ticket water, regular day ticket water, one some secret squirrel run stuff full of carp. There's a lot of carp in there, all small stuff there. Um, small, this was 32 by the way, but um, generally very small carp. And I went into, I think it was Iceland, and bought a regulation frozen roast dinner. The wife cooked it, we put it in the car, we drove down to Hampshire and we started baiting up with it. I caught carp on everything, and this is honest truth, everything in that pack. I caught them on peas, and they were good. I caught them on carrots. I caught them on roast potatoes. Well, no surprise there, because I've already told you 40 years ago I was catching carp, up to double figures from some of the Farnham waters, on parboiled potatoes. I caught them on roast beef. I mean, it got embarrassing, but you know what? I'll tell you this now as a special exclusive to Phil Williams' fishing site. The wife and my son said, oh no, don't put that bit on dad, they won't like that. And you know what I caught them on, this is no word of a lie, I got a piece of napkin which we had, I soaked the napkin in the gravy, I caught them on gravy soaked napkin. And because I had the wife and we were having a picnic as well, I had a carton of white wine. So I thought the carp might like it if I finished off their three course meal, as it were, their roast dinner, with a very nice Sauvignon. And it was a cold, it was all chilled, it was very nice, so I soaked a piece of this napkin serviette in a white Sauvignon wine. I lowered it in the water, and that's a God's honest truth. I caught carp on a piece of wine soap, and I got it on film, I got all this on film, they wouldn't let me use it. But there you go, and that, and that is the truth, so they will eat pretty much anything. And of course, travelling light, I can get to move around fisheries a lot more, so I can move all around, I can take just one rod, one hook, well, I don't take one hook, obviously I take a packet of hooks and spares, but basically a jacket, a landing net, an unhooking mat. Sometimes I don't even bother with scales, to be honest, I caught enough carp, I know what size they weigh. And I just move around the lake and I, I'm trying to spot individual fish, spot cruising fish, look for activity. I might sit quietly beside a bush or something like that, float fish there for an hour or so, no bites. But I always bait up for and move on. And then when I come back a couple of hours later, I have another little float fish or free line in there just to check. Also, I do touch ledgering, which is where you hold the line across the, the ball of your fingers, which are sensitive. I do touch ledgering as well, and that's really exciting. You won't get many carp guys touch ledgering, unless they're the older school and the uh, ancient age like me. They, modern guys wouldn't, know, uh, wouldn't possibly know what it's about. And of course, this way certainly beats the hell out of getting yourself a sack barrel or a trolley or whatever these people use. It's like a removal factory, really. You know, it's just two or three journeys just to get to the one spot. Well, you have to ask yourself by the time you've got all your gear there, actually, is it the right spot? And then if it is the wrong spot and you haven't caught, you want to move, you've got to go back to your van. Well, I say van, I dare say that's camouflage as well with a tail lift. So you go back to your van and you get all your gear out and you move to another lake. Oh dear, who needs all that hassle? Another advice to go into a, a, a day to get water as opposed to a club water is that you're pretty well fishing a water that's been pre-baited for you. I mean, they know what's going in there and they know where it's going in, they know the sort of distances anglers are casting. So that bait emptying business I talk about is one of my mainstays in catching carp. I don't really fish at distance now, I'll be perfectly honest. And I have seen people, well, I expect a lot of you guys that do regular fishing have seen it, you'll see a guy casting from one side of the lake for some obscure reason to the other. And he's trying to get this bait accurate within two feet of the margins. Sometimes it's up a tree, it's through a bush, he loses a gear, he breaks off. Well, I think, well, why don't you just walk around the lake quietly and just lower your bait into position? Why, why is his obsession with the only way to catch carp is by distance casting? 
Makes you wonder who tells these people to do all this, doesn't it? Would it be the tackle dealers? Would it be the manufacturers? Would it be the base suppliers? Well, I don't think so, would it? I don't know. I'll leave it to you guys. So for any up-and-coming youngster, you know, and maybe those people that have done some other types of fishing and want to move into carp fishing, if they've got this prefixed idea that you've got to have all this equipment and you've got to have all these rigs and all this bait, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, you don't have to have it. You can buy it. If you want to buy it, it's entirely up to you. I could go and buy it. I don't want to. I don't want to lug all that gear around. So keep your options open. Don't neglect those smaller thumb fish. And certainly don't lose all those skillful techniques, which is what stood older guys like myself in good stead for so many years, which is why I can go with the minimum of equipment, uh, the most basic bait you can think known to man or to fish a man, and generally, generally, wrinkle a few fish out. By all means, give those boilies and bibbies a go. I'm not saying don't use them. They're very effective. They do catch dirty the 30 and all the big fish there, but you've got to put an inordinate amount of time in to catch some of these fish. You have to understand that some of these guys that are infatuated with big fish spend a lot of time, a lot of bait, and a lot of money in trying to target those fish. That's what they like doing. They obviously enjoy it. I don't want to knock them for what they do in that respect. But what I want to see is the, the youngsters coming into the sport, which they are not going to do with that type of sort of ultra cult fishing, whereby the only good fish is a great big fat balloon belly one. No, it's not. They're missing out on some incredible history of British fishing. When you look how far it's gone from even 50 years ago with basic rods, basic approach, basic baits to where it is now, You've got to ask yourself, these things generally, generally in life do burn out. So I think it's going to go full circle, and I think I've, I can easily illustrate by some of the films I've done that you can go fishing with basic stuff, basic tackle. It's going full circle. Why don't you make sure that you are the one that's at the start of that circle and catch the fish before all the other guys even know about fishing close into the margins. And being the man on the camera, as well as being a non-course angler giving a rod to play with at the same time, I can vouch for the fact that all the techniques mentioned here not only work, but also catch plenty of fish. And on days when the lads in the bivvies fishing with the boilies didn't appear to move even once out of the seats. Mm -hmm.